All right, y'all. So um, I'm going to read to you from this book. It's called The um, Introduction to the Internal Family Systems Model by Richard Schwartz. And um, it's, it's one of these books that I've had for a long time that when, uh, when I'm trying to stay grounded and focused, I, I, re, I reread it. And um, I, I'm, I'm doing this as much for myself as for anyone who's watching this. I just think that it's like good to, good to sometimes go back and read the, the things that have had a big impact on us. Um, Okay, so this is, I'm going to read you chapter one, and then I'm going to read you a section from another like a little few pages up. So, <clears throat> the internal family systems model. Have you ever heard someone say, before I can love someone else, I have to learn to love myself? Or, my problem is that I lack self-esteem. Or, I didn't want to do it, but I couldn't stop myself. Who is this self that we need to learn to love and esteem? And why is that so hard? Who is it that makes us do things we don't want to do? Will we be forever hounded by the critical voice in our head that calls us names all the time? Is there a better way to deal with the sense of worthlessness that sits in the pit of our stomach? How can we turn down the noise that keeps us anxious and distracted? The internal family systems model is set an an, has a set of answers to questions like these that helps people begin to relate to themselves differently, to love themselves. It offers specific steps towards more control over impulsive or automatic reactions. It can transform your inner critical voice into a supportive one and can help you unload feelings of worthlessness. It's capable of helping you not only turn down the noise in your mind, but also create an inner atmosphere of light and peace bringing more confidence, clarity, and creativity to your relationships. The IFS model does this by first getting you to focus inside. By focus inside, I mean to turn your attention towards your thoughts, emotions, fantasies, images, and sensations, your inner experience. This is a big step for most of us because we've been trained by our culture to keep our eyes fixed on the outside world, looking out there for danger as well as for satisfaction. That external focus makes sense because we have a lot to worry about and strive for in our environment. But there's another reason many of us don't enter our inner world. We're afraid of what's in there. We either know or suspect that deep within us lurk memories and feelings that could overwhelm us, making us feel horrible, impending our ability to function, making us act impulsively, changing the way we relate to people, and making us vulnerable to being hurt again. This is particularly true if you were ever humiliated and made to feel worthless, or if you've suffered losses or traumas in your life. To avoid revisiting any of that, you make sure you're always active or distracted, never giving the painful memories an opportunity to bubble up. You organize your life in ways that ensure nothing happens to trigger any of those dreaded memories or emotions. You strive to look and act acceptably, work hard to prove you're valuable, control how close or distant you get in relationships, take care of everyone so they'll like you, so they'll like you, and so on. To better illustrate this idea, let's use an analogy from human relationships. Let's think of your anger as one of your children. Suppose you had a son whom you couldn't control. Say he threw tantrums every night. That would be bad enough. But suppose that because those tantrums drove you crazy, you constantly criticized him and tried to keep him locked up in his room for fear that he'd embarrass you in public. You stayed home on weekends to make sure he didn't run away and felt like a terrible parent because of his behavior. Suppose also that all of your reactions just made the tantrums worse because he sensed that you'd like to be rid of him. Because of the way you relate to your son, the problem comes to consume your life. The same is true with our extreme emotions and irrational beliefs. They're difficult enough, but the way we try to handle them often exacerbates them and makes our lives miserable. It may seem strange to think of having a relationship with a thought or emotion, but we can't avoid it. They live with us and we have to relate to them one way or another. Just as with difficult people in your family or work environment, how they affect you and how you interact with them 
how you interact with them will make a difference. Consider how you feel towards various thoughts and emotions. Maybe you like the inner voice that reminds you of all the things you need to do and strategizes how to do them. You listen to it and you use it as motivation. You relate to it as if it were a valued assistant. What about when you start to relax and that same voice becomes stridently critical, calling you lazy and telling you the sky will fall if you don't get back to work? How do you like it then? What do you say back to it? If you're like most people, you argue with it internally as if it were an oppressive boss. Get off my back. Can't you let me sit still for even a minute? Lighten up. Or you try to drown it out by watching TV or having a few drinks. The part of you that wants to achieve makes for a wonderful for a wonderful servant, but a terrible master. So you have a love-hate relationship with it. We have ongoing, complex relationships with many different inner voices, thought patterns, and emotions that are all similar to relationships we have with other people. What we call thinking is often our inner dialogue with our different parts of us. Let's take another example. Think of someone you love who has died. How do you feel towards the grief you have about that person? Maybe you fear being overwhelmed by it and hate the way it brings you down. You try to keep it locked up somewhere in your psyche and avoid anything that might remind you of the dead loved one. You also, you also get impatient with it. Why do I still feel this way after all this time? I thought I'd already worked through all that. You try to turn it into an intrapsychic exile, yet, like an exile, it keeps popping back up, overtaking you when you're not looking and throwing internal coups. What about the part of you that gets extremely defensive when you argue with your intimate partner? In the middle of the fight, you suddenly become that part, seeking your partner, seeing the part through seeing your partner through its eyes, taking on its distorted black and white blame guilt perspective, stubbornly refusing to give an inch and saying nasty things. Later you realize you were out of line under who was it that took over and behaved so obnoxiously? That wasn't me. How do you feel towards that inner defender? If you're like most people, you don't like some aspects of it, but you feel so vulnerable during a fight that you rely on it for protection. You let it take over because you believe that without it, your partner will blow you away. Your anger becomes like a tough bodyguard you like having around but wouldn't invite to dinner. All the people I've described in this chapter came to me at war with themselves. They were knotted in dysfunctional inner relationships and, not surprisingly, their outer relationships paralleled their inner ones. By changing the way they regarded and interacted with their thoughts and emotions, they found that not only did the problem they brought to therapy improve dramatically, but in general, they felt less inner turmoil liked themselves more, and got along better with the people in their lives. What was the direction of that change? They moved from hating, fearing, arguing with, trying to ignore, lock up, or get rid of, or giving in to and being overwhelmed by all those feelings and beliefs, to becoming curious about them and listening to them. The initial curiosity often led to compassion for their emotions and thoughts and attempts to heal from them. So I'm going to skip around here a little bit. I'm going to skip around here and I'm going to go, I'm going to go to the part that this is actually the part that I, I read to myself when, when I'm trying to, when I'm trying to get back on track. Okay. So this is in the chapter called the self. <clears throat> okay. Um, the secret of the gods. According to an ancient legend, there was a time when the gods were trying to decide where to hide the secret to peace and joy. I was born during the war in Hackney, survived... Yeah, I'm going to end this and then I saw someone else's screen.